God this morning. Say amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, it's my uh, privilege to uh, 
have our assistant pastor speak this morning. Amen. So uh, I know nobody thinks this carnally, but just in case you do, I want to set the record straight. Amen. Praise the Lord. I appreciate, and, and our assistant pastor happens to be our son. Yeah. And so we were, uh, we were in our trustees meeting, and Jim was ordained last week. Wow, we had a full-blooded Oneida Indian. We had a Jewish guy that wrapped him around and gave him a shawl, prayer shawl from Israel. We had Hal Santos from Indiana, Don Schultz from the southern part of the state, and just a, a powerful, that was for, he, he, just like we do with anybody in the church, we have 90 days. My dad always told me, <laughs> 90 days, and you'll find out if a man is good, if they're good workers, and we were talking not necessarily spiritual things, but, but you find out in 90 days, and Jim's, so he's been here all summer, and so his 90 days of pro, probation is up, and uh, amen, so you have been on probation, amen. <laughs> So uh, we were we we're looking. We we were we we needed some help here, and so our trustees were looking, and and we've been we were praying about it, and and uh, and I didn't say it. I didn't say his name. I didn't bring him up because he was in Eau Claire, was doing good at the time, and so uh, the trustees and elders we met to, together, and they said, "Do you know of anybody who could fit this bill?" I said, "Yeah, I do. I do. His name is Jim." I think is and uh, and so we talked about uh, uh, Jim and I like two or three years ago. Larry and I have been praying uh, faithfully every week, and and uh, after right after Jim got married, we went for a walk and I said, Jim, you know, I don't know how ever things are going to go in your life, but I don't want an answer now. I don't want it a month from now. I don't want it a year from now. I don't want it two years from now. I want you to talk about it, pray about it, and just sense if God ever leads you back here. Um, let me know, and and you know, and so um, so our trustees said, uh, "Do you know of anybody?" And I said, "Yep." Here's his number, and our trustees and elders met with Jim, and and uh, it worked out, and we're very very thankful to have a full time on staff assistant pastor. Somebody say amen to that. That's really really good, and I'm I'm thankful, and so he's he's helped us. He's helping us in the school. He's helping me. Um, personally and with the, the church and carrying the load of ministry and speaking and um, and it's not always that uh, that a person or myself I'll speak for myself I'm not able to it's just that it's nice to have a break once in a while somebody say amen to that um, and so I, I appreciate that and he's just really lightened um, my load, our load here, he's working. And then with the whole thing, we're online. How many know we had to become televangelists overnight? We did. We didn't know anything about being on Internet or whatever. And we stayed up, I think it was till, I don't know, that night. Uh, who, who was here? 3.30, 4.30 in the morning, something like that. And uh, But we never missed a Sunday, even when we were closed. We never missed a Sunday. So... So Jim's working in that aspect and kind of the technical IT, and we're very, very thankful for him. Jim Warner, God bless you. In the word of the Lord, let's welcome him this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. So <laughs> the similars run too similar sometimes because I'm also a little stuffed up, as you can hear. But... Um, so I don't know what happened in the last month, but the last time I spoke was October 3rd, and I spoke on 1 Corinthians 13, and my dad it's like, why don't you do 14? So I don't know what's been going on the last three weeks. We had missions conference in there. We hit a couple aspects of it, but we've got all the way to the next chapter in, the, in that amount of time. So I was trying to count the number of services, and we had like seven to nine services if you were at everything over missions conference, plus a couple of Sundays in there. So... Um, we've, it feels like it's been a long time, so I like to start with a little review of where we're at. Um, so remember we were talking, now this is back in September, chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, we we're talking all about the spiritual gifts, charismatic gifts. Everybody say gifts. 
You want gifts. That's what Paul is talking about. So Paul continually is talking to these Christians, and he's, he's, he's kind of just guiding them in their church, how they conduct things, how they do things. He's kind of just leading them around. And um, if you go bowling and you're not good at bowling, what do you put up around the, the edge of the bowling alley there? And you put these bumpers up. And that's kind of what Paul has to do because... Because they kind of get over here, and he's like, nope, don't, don't go that far that way. And, and then on this side, you guys are off over here, and he just kind of is steering them in the right direction. So we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. Uh, so for our reading here, uh, I want to start with a passage from Isaiah that I really like. So um, Old Testament, book of Isaiah, chapter 55. You can turn there if you would like. Isaiah 55, verse 8 through the beginning of verse 12. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Amen? For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper the thing which I sent it. For you shall go out with joy and be led out with peace. Now from the book of James chapter 3. I love the book of James, and if you're you're pretty, if, if you want to, you can just about pick a verse from James, James to apply to any, any uh, text, any principle, any theme, because James is kind of the Proverbs of the New Testament. It just has a lot of uh, wisdom, words of wisdom through it. So James chapter 3, verse, uh, I'll actually start in verse 14, and I'll end in 17. I'll, I'll make it a little shorter here. It says, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not wisdom that comes from above, but it's earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere." And finally, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, that's going to be our main study here this morning. 1 Corinthians 14, I'm just going to read the first six verses and then the last about eight verses. So starting in verse 1, it says, Pursue love and earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in, in a tongue speaks not to men but to God, for one for no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. No one who prophesies is greater, the one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets, so the church may be built up. And then we're going to skip ahead to verse 26 and read to the end of the chapter, and it says this. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson of revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation, let all things be done for the building up or the edification. If any speak in a tongue, let there be two or three at most, each in turn, and let some interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let him keep silent in the church or speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but a God of peace, 
and of order. Okay, so hopping back a little bit. So we're talking about the, the gifts of the Spirit in chapter 12. Um, all the different ones from the gift of tongues, the gift of helping ministry, the prophesying, and all these different spiritual gifts. As it, weather gets colder, the next thing to look forward to is Christmas time. We all want gifts for Christmas, right? So hopefully we... Have you seen the news headlines about DeSanta down in Florida trying to open the ports and allow all the ships that are stuck in California to come through Florida? So they're calling them DeSanta to come and save Christmas in the nick of time. So if you want, uh, if you want gifts, you need to desire those. You need to ask for those things. And what you have to do to receive a gift, you have to open it. You have to accept it. These are gifts the Holy Spirit wants to give you. And apparently, desiring it and asking for it is part of it, because Paul is continually urging. He says, desire these gifts. Seek these gifts. These are the ones you want. And once you get it, here's how you operate in that gift. There's a correct way to go about it. And then he, said, he ends chapter 12 by saying, but there's a greater way. And that opens up to chapter 13, which is all about love. The, the correct God kind of love, the love that is only from God. That agape is the Greek word there. It's the self-sacrificial love that is not self-seeking. It's only for other people's benefit, and it can only come from God. The only way we can even operate in that is if we first understand God's love for us so that we can love other people. And it finally uh, concludes with there's faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. That brings us to chapter 14. And it opens with, hey, let's prophesy. So uh, today the first thing I want to talk about is a little bit about prophecy. So prophecy and kind of my, my version of uh, the Greek and some other uh, study on it. Prophecy is essentially the ability given by the Holy Spirit. It's not something you can just do. It's that gift, the gift of prophecy, to speak forth the words, wisdom, and counsel of God. Sometimes we think of a prophetic word. Somebody, somebody might speak that. So uh, Paul is talking about tongues and prophecy a lot here in chapter 14. He's talking about correct order in how to do these things. So just because there's a gift doesn't mean it'll always work correctly. Just like in physics, there's to every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction with human beings. For every bad, ignorant action, there's an equally ignorant reaction from somebody else. So we as humans tend to kind of ping pong back and forth between, the, between those gutters um, in bowling, and we need something to kind of come up and say, okay, nope, this is center. Nope, this is center. Nope, this is right. Because we're all going to have a different opinion. We're all going to have a different thought. We're all going to have a different, our own biases mixed in there. And we need something outside of ourselves to say, nope, this is the right way to do it. This is how this operates. This is what's right. This is what's center. This is what we're aiming for. This is what we want. Nope, you're a little bit off there. Nope, come back this way a little bit. You're doing that just not quite right, but your heart's in the right place. And we need just to come alongside each other and work with each other as the body of Christ for the body of Christ edification. We're trying to build up. Chapter 13 was all about the reason why we want to build up. And 14, about seven times throughout this chapter, uses the word edify, 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 edification for your own edification, for the church's edification. It's all about building up each other. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But prophecy is this ability by the Holy Spirit to speak forth the wisdom and counsel of God. Sometimes it can just be something that, that you have in yourself, and it doesn't have to be like, thus saith the Lord necessarily, but it can even be, you know, I think, I think you just need to spend a little time in prayer. I've just been thinking about you, and you might be going through something, and just like a word to encourage somebody. It doesn't Sometimes we have this picture of what it has to be, and we say, well, I've never done that, or, or I've never, you know, I can't do that, but, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe this gift isn't for me. Um, even today, I was talking to my dad, and he was like, well, you did this and this, and I was like, I didn't know that was prophecy. I'd never thought of it like that. So sometimes we just have a picture in our head that isn't quite right of what prophecy is. Uh, and sometimes prophecy can be used incorrectly. 
prophecy should never be used to dominate, manipulate, control, intimidate. We don't have one prophet that is the sole mouthpiece of God and everything has to go through them and all, only they can hear from God, only they can speak for God. That's a cult. That is not, that's not a right gifting. That's not a right exercise of the gift of prophecy. So sometimes you have to be careful of that for people self-seeking. They can even have the gift of prophecy and then can try to use that gift that's been given incorrectly for their own gain, for their own purposes. That's not how we're intended to do that. Remember, these gifts are to be practiced in love. Love is not self-seeking. Love is sacrificial. It's not for your own gain. You're thinking of other people to build up the church, to build up other people. So prophecy is always designed to build up, to stir up, or to cheer up. You want to encourage people. Words of prophecy, this is the reason that Paul is, is saying you want to prophesy. This is why this is one of the greatest gifts in a church setting is prophecy. You are speaking forth the counsel and mind of God. You're building other people up. You're saying who, how God sees people. You're articulating that. What God sees into a situation, you're articulating that. Yes, this is something that's blessed. Yes, this is a good thing. You're affirming things because God would affirm it. And you're not doing that out of your own intellect, out of your own uh, assumptions or your own estimations. You're having a Holy Spirit encounter where God is working through you and using you to communicate through the gift that you've been given, which is prophecy. So prophecy does build up. We can sometimes get, and um, the other side of the, the whole, the dominating, the control, where people use it incorrectly, is when people are pulling you aside and saying, hey, I have this prophetic word just for you. Shh, you know, don't, don't listen to anybody else. This is just for you. Don't tell anybody about this, but th this is what God has for you. That's not how it's supposed to be done. Paul even says, when you prophesy, let there be two or three people there that are, have this prof prophetic gift. Let them prophesy. Let them prophesy in front of other people. And as each is prophesying, let the other people there stand around that also have the gift, also have some discernment, and let them say, yes, I believe that's what God is saying, or, or be able to say, you know, you might be kind of off on that one. Let's, let's check that. I, I, I wouldn't really go with that. So just like everything, there's, there's two ditches. So with prophecy, you don't want to just swallow everything and, hey, this, this guy claims to be a prophet. He said this. This is, this is what's going to happen. And believe it without any discernment, any confirmation, any thought, any cross-reference with Scripture. Because just because something is claimed to be, as we easily find out on the internet or anywhere else in marketing, just because it's claimed to be doesn't necessarily mean it is. Which means you have a responsibility to put some discernment, put some thought, put some scriptural study behind it. So prophecy essentially requires discernment and really is discernment. It's discerning the heart of God. It's discerning what the counsel of God is in a situation. It's discerning what God feels about an individual. It's saying, you know, you, you might be feeling kind of beat up right now. That's not how God sees you. You know how God sees you? God sees you as a child of God. God sees you as having all this potential. God sees you as this. And it's not just necessarily cheerleading, but that's part of it. You're building other people up. You're using this gift to help other people. You're not using it to be self-serving. You're using it to sharpen other people. Sometimes it's even saying, you know what? You've been called to something higher than you're in right now. Sometimes it's almost a rebuke. Sometimes it's saying, you know what? You know a little bit better than this. You could be living better than this. This is where God wants you, and you're kind of just hanging out down here right now. God has better things for you. You don't have to live down here anymore. That's not where you've been called. So it stirs up, it builds up, and it encourages. It, it cheers up. And prophecy does require discernment from both the prophet and people taking in that prophecy People that hear this prophetic word, they have to have some discernment on themselves. Uh, Jesus never really specifically prophesies, but everything he says, he says, I only do what the Father does. I only say what I hear this Father say. So essentially, everything that Jesus spoke was a prophetic word. Every word that he uttered was prophecy because he only spoke and said and did the heart and the mind and the will 
of his heavenly Father. And that's what prophecy is. So Jesus is a picture of prophecy, and Scripture will always line up with prophecy. So if sometimes there's prophetic words, there's no Scripture on that. When you, so if you, there is a Scripture on it and it conflicts, that's not an accurate prophecy. It will not contradict the Word of God. We talked this morning, God doesn't change. His Word doesn't change. He isn't going to say this is okay today and it's not okay later. This is sin now and, that, and it's not sin anymore. This, this is fine now. Culture does those sort of things, but God doesn't. So you have to have some discernment to say, is this prophetic word accurate or not? And sometimes we just don't know. Sometimes we have to wait for some confirmation. Sometimes we seek the other, some other seasoned, mature people in the faith that may also have that gift to kind of bounce that off of. Sometimes we just have to sit and wait. Sometimes we don't know. So it is, it is a difficulty, but Paul is kind of working with this young, immature church to say, A, don't everybody talk at once. You guys can't just be shouting and yelling. Don't be, don't be talking over each other and interrupting each other. Let's have some order in our service. Let's conduct ourselves in a way that can be productive. How many of you guys, um, some of you here were here for Missions Conference. I really appreciated Hal Santos' message. And one thing that spoke out to me, he said, we, we're always busy, but are you being productive? Don't just seek to busy yourself. How productive are you being? And that was really challenging to me. I was like, I'm busy all the time, but am I always productive? Probably not, but I'm always busy. But um, we want to have some discernment. So the ditches with prophecy, we don't want to ignore it. We don't want to say, hey, I don't really know what to do with that prophecy, that Holy Spirit thing. That makes me uncomfortable let's just not do that. Let's just not read those passages. Let's just not operate in those gifts. Let's just keep that out of the church because, you know, sometimes that gets used wrong. So people abuse that. You know, I don't really know if that's a thing. Let's just ignore that. Let's just not have any prophetic word in the church. You're asking for nobody to build each other up, cheer each other up, stir each other up, convict. You're saying, I don't want any words of God, any counsel of God, any wisdom of God to flow through the house of God. No wonder the church is in shambles sometimes because we ignore the counsel of God. We don't have people building it up and edifying one another and speaking forth the heart and mind of God in the church as it should be. And the other side of it is just to shut your brain off and just, hey, this guy says they're a prophet. I saw this on YouTube. I saw this on the internet. Sometimes they're valid. Sometimes they're not. You have to use some discernment. You have to back that up with scripture. You have to look for confirmation because you can, it can be claimed and we can even look for the right way to do it in scripture is by having other people stand there and confirm other people with this prophetic gift be also prophesying, and it's always done in an orderly, peaceful manner. We can always also look at it by its fruit. You know, if, if, it's, if it's causing fear and an intimidation, if it's causing panic, is that from God? Is that the peaceful God, the loving God that we serve? Is he, is he causing strife and panic? No. That's not the God we serve. And even if there is an end time, we as Christians shouldn't be looking forward to that with dread. We're looking for our king to come back. We're looking for Jesus to come back. We're focusing on him. So we're not panicking. We're not looking in fear. We're saying, finally, the thing we've been working for for thousands of years, God is bringing to fruition. Finally, we're coming home. Finally, Jesus is going to be the king. Finally, we don't have to have these worldly leaders anymore. Finally, we don't have to have imperfect leaders anymore. We can have Jesus be our king. We can have his kingdom come and his will be done as it was in the beginning and as it will happen again. So the second, the second thing that Paul talks about in chapter 14 is the gift of tongues. This is another one where sometimes it can get out of balance. If I just started speaking in tongues, if I did that for 45 minutes, would you guys understand anything that I said? Would it help you in any way? Probably not. It could help me, and there's a great place for that gift of tongues, is when you're praying. Paul talks about when you speak in tongues, he says your spirit is praying, but your mind is not. You're not getting anything cognitively or intellectually out of it. They've actually done tests and done EKGs on people who are speaking in tongues. The language center of their brain 
is out of it. There's nothing going on there anymore because you're not processing language. Other parts of your brain light up and it, it, even, it even shows and validates that something is happening beyond you know, just babblings and mutterings like some people think tongues is. There's things that go on and it's a valid thing. And once again, Paul says, don't hinder tongues. I desire that you speak in tongues. He even says, I am so glad that I speak in tongues more than all of you do. So he took hours and hours to speak in tongues daily. Did he do that in, from the pulpit? No, he did not. Sometimes he said, you can if there's an interpreter where somebody gives a word in tongues and somebody interprets it in the language that the people understand. Just like every instrument has a sound, just like there's a lot of languages out there, we want to communicate accurately to the people in a corporate worship service. If I spoke this entire message in German, it wouldn't probably help anybody here unless you happen to speak German. So we want to communicate when we're in church something that's helpful, that I can build up, that I can encourage, that I can teach, that we can communicate something. Otherwise, it doesn't profit anybody other than myself, which then I could do that at home. Why am I wasting time in a church service to do that? That's the type of wisdom Paul is bringing. So uh, the prayer in tongues and the gift of tongues is a prayer of the Spirit. It's not something that happens in your mind, your brain. Uh, it's not cognitively forming these words. It's a different tongue. Sometimes the tongue is actually in other languages. They've done other studies where um, somebody would speak in different languages. At times, some of the languages he was speaking in are actual languages and people could understand it. I've heard of um, somebody speaking in tongues in a church service and somebody from Africa saying, that's my native tongue. That's what I grew up in. How does this white person know what I'm saying? And, it's, it, and they can actually understand and translate what's being said. That's part of the gift of tongues. That's something that happens at Pentecost. People were able to speak in tongues of the different people there, and it was a sign to the unbelievers that, hey, how are these people from Galilee all of a sudden speaking my native tongue? They shouldn't be able to know that. It's a sign that it's a gift from God. It's something supernatural is going on. Paul even says tongues is a sign to unbelievers. It points to God. It's something that can say, hey, God is really here. But for believers, we already believe God exists. We already believe in the supernatural ability of tongues and the gifts of the Spirit. Therefore, it doesn't really help us to speak in tongues. If I'm going to pray over somebody, I can pray in tongues to myself until I hear what God's saying, but it doesn't help them if I'm only praying in tongues. So Paul's just giving some guidance and saying, here's how you use this gift orderly. You don't all speak in tongues at once. You don't all interrupt each other. If 12 of you randomly throughout the service started speaking in tongues, it would be disruptive unless there was someone to interpret, unless it was a communication that God prompted on your heart. There's nothing wrong with that if there's an interpreter there. Otherwise, it's just a distraction. Otherwise, it's just disorder. Otherwise, it's not profitable to our church, to the service. So he's just bringing some, some order to these gifts. The next one is maturity, and if, you're anything, if you've known me for any amount of time or you're my wife, you're saying, how are you preaching a message on maturity? Well, let me tell you, if God can use Gideon, a weak person, to lead an army, he can use me to speak on maturity. Um, and maturity is grounded in God's word. Maturity requires growth. Maturity produces unity, and maturity leads to discernment. As we look through 1 Corinthians, actually a few chapters back, back in chapter 3, chapter 3 is talking about this. Paul first says, um, early on in this book, he says, Brethren, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but I had to as carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for in, until now you are not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal, you're still fleshly. For there are many envyings and strifes and divisions among you, and you are not, 
Are you not carnal? Are you not behaving like mere men or like the heathens do? So he's saying, I'm having to speak to you guys like baby Christians that don't have any understanding. You're very immature in your walk with Christ. You don't understand these gifts. You don't even understand how to sit quietly through a meeting. You guys are arguing. You guys are fighting. You're letting strife and disorder run your church service. Where's the presence of God in your church service? Is that the God of peace operating in you? No, that's something else. So he's, he's rebuking them for their immaturity, for allowing these things to happen. Um, in the last chapter, in the chapter 13, that's all in the book of love, there's one random verse in the middle that seemingly has nothing to do with anything else, unless you look at this context of this theme of immaturity that he's bringing. 1 Corinthians 13, 11 says, When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. The thought train changes, everything just kind of moves on from there. It's like, what is that verse doing in the middle of this chapter about love? But he's saying, you, we need to grow up a little bit. We, we need to become a little more mature in our faith in order to operate in these gifts in order to have this this love like God has we need to grow up a little bit we need to understand these truths of scripture we need to quit with our childish antics and quit fighting quit arguing quit allowing these fights and things to go on they're just distractions they're not profitable they're not helping anything we can't be like that anymore you got to grow up a little bit that's what Paul is saying in verse in this chapter in verse 20 of chapter 14, he says, Brethren, do not be like little children in your understanding. However, in the matters of malice and anger and strife, then you can be like babies, then you can be immature, then you can be inexperienced. But in these matters, I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to not understand what's going on. You can be very naive and unintelligent about the ways of the world, about all the evilness out there, about all these things that happen. Sure, be immature about that. Don't have, I don't want you to be an expert on, the, on anger, on bitterness, on hatred, on malice, on all these evil things that are in the world. You don't need to be an expert on it. You don't need to grow in that. But what you do need to grow in is understanding the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, the truths of God's Word, the order that He's trying to bring through that, the heart that He's trying to cultivate in you. And the purpose for it all is edification. So we need to grow up a little bit. We need to have some spiritual maturity. And finally, that brings us to the order of God. The love of God from chapter 13 should cultivate in us an obedience for God's word. There's a scripture that says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If we love God, we should love his word. If we claim to love God but don't read his word and don't obey his word, do we really love God in the first place? If we say our love, we, we love our earthly parents, but we don't listen to a single thing the way they say, we just ignore them and go our own way, do we really love them? Are we loving the way God is intending us to love? So if we love God and have the same love back for him, we're going to take attention. We're going to pay attention to what he says and do our best to follow that. Ever notice if there is a clear path in Scripture of how to do something, how to do family, how to do relationships, how to do work, and how to do different things like that? If you deviate from that, it doesn't go well. And if you do exactly how God designed it to work, it works out pretty well for you. It's almost like God knows us a little more than we do, like God is writing the manual for the correct way to live, and it works out every time. So if we love God, we will obey him. If we obey him, we're going to look to what the scripture is saying about edification in the first place. In this chapter, we keep hearing edification, edification, edification. It simply means to build others up. Like iron sharpens iron, we are to build others up. We can do that with tongues through an interpreter. We can do that through prophecy. These are gifts that are intended to build each other up. If you need to be built up yourself, speak in tongues, pray to God, read your word, get in the spirit, try to seek his presence. You want his presence, you want his peace. Where God's presence is, there is order, there is peace, there is a number of 
benefits. You, you look at places geographically without God, their economy is in the pit. There's crime is rampant. Government is all corrupt. And you look where places where there are scripture, where, there, where Christians are, you just see all this prosperity. It's like God is just putting on display, if you follow my word, it'll go well with you. If you don't, look what happens. And we still try to do our own way. We still try to fix it. But godly wisdom, as we saw in the book of James chapter 3, is pure, peaceful, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy. The fruit of the Spirit are operating there. It's impartial. It's not prejudice. And it's free of hypocrisy. That's hard for us to say sometimes where we struggle with some of these things. But this is what the order of God is. And where we don't see the order of God, where we see these, this church coming from is this place of immaturity. There is an order. There's actually disorder. So we see this disorder of man. We see from 1 Corinthians, he's saying there's envy and strife and divisions among you. That's a sign of immaturity. That's a sign of God's order and peace and presence not operating in there. So we don't want to be having divisions and arguments within the church. That doesn't reflect God. That doesn't show a good witness. That's not how the, that's not God's order in service. Disorder is confusion and every evil thing comes out of it. And it all kind of roots back to selfishness. We see um, back in the book of uh, James chapter 3, we see But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, then you lie and boast against the truth. It's actually kind of saying it in the negative, don't do that. But he's saying, then you have this wisdom that is not from God that you're operating in that's earthly, sensual, and demonic. So it is true we're either kind of following God or typically we're following ourselves. However, sometimes we, we fail to realize that Yes, we follow ourselves. Yes, we get ourselves into trouble. Yes, we're often the author of our own misfortune. We, we're off, often the maker of our own suffering because we make mistakes. We set ourselves up. We try to do it our own way. But we also have to remember that this is not simply fleshly. It's not simply soulish. It actually becomes demonic. We also have to be very aware that there is a hell. There is a devil. He does have evil spirits in league with him. He does want to kill, steal, and destroy. So not only do we have to work against our own flesh that's fallen and corrupt, but we have an active adversary out there trying to create strife, trying to create divisions. You look at spirits operating in the world today. Spirits of division, disunity. Let's pit every type of people group against every other type of people group. Let's have this person hate this person and this type hate this type. This type be guilty to this type. This one be owing this one. And there's no reconciliation. There's no redemption. There's no forgiveness taught. It's only evil continually. Wait for this person to mess up. Wait for this group to do this. Look what this person did. Look what this person said. Look what this group believes. Oh, look, I have this picture picture from 1922 of this person doing this. Clearly, he hates all of this. You know, it's, it's ridiculous. Where is this from? Is this from mere flesh? Is this, are people thinking this stuff makes sense? No, this is a demonic spirit that has come in that is driving forth strife, that is pushing disorder, that is pushing disunity. None of that is godly, none of that is orderly, and none of that belongs in a church service. None of that is from God. So while we do have the disorder of man, we have to remember that it's not simply man is causing the disorder, which we do a pretty good job on ourse as ourselves. But as we look at the world, we see spiritual forces at work that we as Christians can identify through the discernment that we talked about. And we have to work against that because the reality is there are spiritual forces working in this church, in every good church. Where else would this Satan set up camp? Out in places he's already conquered? Is he worried about what goes on in the bar? Is he worried about people preaching Jesus in their own flesh, in their own drunken state? 
Probably not. He's worried about Christians who understand who they are in Christ, that are flowing in the gifts of the Spirit, that have the very keys to hell in their hand, that can combat and fight back against his spirits of darkness in the world. That's where he's going to target. That's where he's going to focus. So we need to be aware of this battle that we're in. We need to be aware that there are things going on here. We need to be actively battling against this disorder. We need to be working toward forgiveness. We need to be working toward peace. We need to be working toward unity. And some of that takes a couple of things we talked about before. It takes maturity. I'm not going to get bent out of shape about everything. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let that one slide off. I'm going to let that one roll off a little bit. I'm going to grow up a little bit. Sometimes we need just to get over our flesh a little bit, but also we need to take authority in the spirit as well. Excuse me. So the point of chapter 13 was love, and we see the root of all the strife, all the disorder, all the bitterness, the malice, the hatred, every evil thing. It comes from a heart condition of instead of the love of God, it comes from a selfish desire. When we see these gifts being twisted and bent out of shape and abused, it's because they're being used to build up yourself, not other people. When the love of God says to put other people first, we want to put our thoughts first, our desires first. And as soon as I put my desires against anybody else's desire, we're going to have conflict because I'm going to want my way, they're going to want their way. And everyone's got a different opinion, everyone's got a different perspective. Um, Sometimes, you know, it's just our perspective that changes how we see things, and that's just going to cause that's going to cause friction, that's going to cause disunity, that's going to cause fights, that's going to cause arguments, because as soon as we leave our desire for God's plan to happen, we start just battling in our own selves. So as we talk about order and we talk about maturity, um, I feel underqualified to talk about either one of those. I'm the disorderly one in the house and my wife's quite orderly. And we have these nice white kitchen cabinets in our, in our kitchen. And my wife would always be like, why do you leave these greasy fingerprints all over these white cabinets? Like, how do you not notice? Like, she'd like bring it up really nicely and then bring it up again really nicely. And I just, I'm like, I don't see any fingerprints. I don't know what she's talking about. She's being overly critical, whatever, you know. So I just like keep going. And finally, after this goes on for months and frustration builds, and she's like, how do you not see what you're doing? Like, do you see all these greasy fingerprints over the white cabinets? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And finally, I come next to my wife, who's five foot two, and I go like this, and I go, oh, those fingerprints, because we have a light that sits about this high, and from my perspective, it is completely in shadow. If you drop about a foot down, fingerprints just appear everywhere. So to prove my, at least, innocent ignorance, I come over and I pick my wife up, and I say, look at what I see, and they just all disappear. And she's like, Oh, no wonder you don't know what I'm talking about. No wonder you can't see it. No wonder it's just a matter of perspective. No wonder, like, I'm not seeing the problem. Only she's seeing the problem. And I'm like, isn't life great up here? My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. You know, no, 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 no. My thoughts are not. No, but we have to be aware that each of us is going to have a different perspective when it comes to matters of where the church should go, what's best for the church, how do we build it up, how do we grow it, how do we do this, how do we do that. We're all going to have an opinion. We're going to all have a thought. If we just operated on that level, we would battle over that. We will have strife over that. We will have conflict over that. However, if we follow the model that God lays out, which is an orderly model, the only way to have order is to take ourselves out of it. We're the ones that cause the strife. We're the ones that cause the bitterness. We're the ones that cause the friction. Because we put me, me, me in there. What I see, what I see, what I see. What I think, what I think, what I think. And we just battle back and forth. No, my way's better. No, my way's better. 
And as soon as we take ourselves out of it and say, this is what God has. He has a love that says, let me not look after my needs. Let me look at the needs of others. How do I make sure this person's doing well? How do I build them up? How can I cheer up Jackie Clifford today? How can I make Becky's day this morning? How can I help Jason out? What does he need today? Rather than saying, I need to do this. I need to get lunch. I need to go do this. I have this family thing. I have this thing. I have this thing. These are all the things that I have to do. Take a moment back and say, how does God see this? What is, what is God asking me to do today? How can I build somebody up today? How can I make their day better? How can I make them a better Christian? How can I build their relationship up with God? How can I encourage them today? How can I help them accomplish their goals today? And that paradigm shift changes everything. All of a sudden, instead of fighting and warring, we are trying to speak the mouth and counsel of God into other people. We're trying to build other people up. We're trying to bless them and pray for them, encourage them, and work together with them to accomplish the same goal because we're on the same page from the same manual of Scripture that we have, and we take ourselves out of it. And that's the only way to overcome the bitterness, the strife, the tensions, the warrings and fightings. James chapter 4 says, where do all the wars and fights come from among you? Don't they come from your own desires, your fleshly desires for this and that? You want something so bad, so you, you're causing all this friction. But when we take ourselves out of it, we can finally allow the peace of God to come in, the order of God to come in, and allow things to run in a way that it's profitable for other people. We're not just busy being ourselves with things. We're actually benefiting one another. We're building one another up. So, in conclusion, we want to edify through prophecy. Edify is the key word of chapter 14. It is there over and over and over again. And prophecy is meant to build up. Keep it simple. You build up, you cheer up, you stir up. You want to speak forth the counsel and the word in the heart of God. You want to see people the way God sees them and speak that out with your mouth. Live that out with your action. Treat them the way God would treat them in human form if he was here. That's a tall order because we let our own biases, our own insecurities, our own overreactions come out where, well, this person said this, and I know they mean this, and then, they, ah, well, I'm going to get them with this thing, because this is what, you know, and we go back and forth. But as soon as we take ourselves out of it and say, God, how, what do you want me to say to this person? How do you want me to treat this person? How, can I, how do you want me to act in service? How can I be a help to other people? How can I serve this person this morning? How can I build them up? How can I edify them? That's what prophecy is intended to do. And that's what the body of Christ is intended to do. You can also do that through tongues. You can, he, Paul even says, you can edify yourself through tongues. And a lot of us need that sometimes. So speaking in tongues is a wonderful thing. Taking time to set apart, to understand the heart and counsel of God, to speak forth a perfect prayer language. If you don't do that already... That's something you can desire. That's something you can ask God for. Say, God, give me that gift of tongues. Help me to learn how to operate in that. Help me learn how to speak that. Help me be comfortable with that. Help me to speak that in my own prayer time. Help me to understand what to pray for when I don't know how to pray, when my mind runs out of my 10 things that I can keep in my head of things to pray for and I don't know what to pray for next. Help me to pray in tongues. Help me to build myself up. If you want to have the gift of interpretation of tongues and with that operating in the church and you know that, you can speak forth an encouraging word in tongues and somebody else can interpret. Uh, I went to an Assemblies of God school and they believe in the Holy Spirit, but they don't operate into it very much. So we ha we'll have speakers that don't believe in the Holy Spirit, don't really operate in that. And we had one speaker who everybody knew didn't believe in tongues, didn't believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And he was speaking to the whole auditorium. And he, he had to cut his message short for time. He got three out of his four points. And, you know, some, some of the, the staff and faculty are just kind of like on edge. They're, they're like, you know, help us just get through this service. Let's not ruffle any feathers with this guy. You know, we believe in the Holy Spirit more than he does. But, you know, and somebody stands up at the end of the service and gives this big word in tongues, just start speaking in tongues. 
And, and they're just hanging their heads, you know. And then somebody else stands up and gives the interpretation. So the faculty has to take this uh, prestigious speaker out and they go for lunch and finally he's like, somebody finally got the nerve to ask, so what did you, what you think of service? And what do you think of that guy at the end speaking in tongues? And the guy said, I only had time to hit three out of my four points. The word in tongues and the interpretation was exactly verbatim the fourth point I had written down and didn't have time to share. And like, and that, that's how it ended. So that's, that's how tongues can work and that's how it can be used. Somebody needed to hear that word. The Holy Spirit knew that. Somebody was prompted to speak through the gift of tongues. Somebody else had the gift of interpretation and the boldness to speak out the interpretation. And that's the order designed by God, the Holy Spirit, and in Scripture of how that should operate. And then finally, we want to be on guard against fighting, against strife, against arguments. We shouldn't, in, and not only in a church, we, we have, this kind of bleeds into home life and our own personal life. We don't want to allow fights and arguments among family members. We don't want to allow stress, stress and conflict and warring go on at home, let alone the church, let alone, you know, why would anything that would be good in the church, why would you want to do that in your own private life? Why would you want to fake it when you go to church? So the same order and unity and peace you want over your home, you want in your life, you want in your personal relationships. It doesn't just apply to when you're at church on Sunday morning, it applies in who you are as a believer. It's a call of responsibility to you. So we have to be on guard for unforgiveness, bitterness, malice, strife, and all these evil things that are born out of our own selfish ambition, selfish desires, that are, where our own flesh gets baited by very intelligent, very smart, evil, e- evil demon spirits that know our weakness and try to pull us out here, try to drive a wedge in this relationship, try to bring disunity here, have discord and chaos, and where that's operating And what's not operating, edification, building one another up. I can't talk to this person anymore because this, this, and this. How are you ever going to be able to edify and build that person up as you're called to do, as you're responsible to do, if you can't even talk to them over some bitterness and some unforgiveness that you have in your life? You have to grow up past that. You have to have a little maturity. You have to allow that to roll off. Allow yourself to forgive. Allow yourself to move on. And we want to operate in the peace of God. We want to operate in the order of God. First Chronicles 16.11 says this, Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. And that's what we want in church service. We want God's presence. And with his presence comes order, comes that sense of peace, comes the attitudes and the gifts of the Spirit flowing, all the fruit of the Spirit operating, patience and gentleness, kindness and meekness, humility, self-sacrificing love, giving of one another, encouraging one another, building each other up. Doesn't that sound like a great place? Does that sound like a foreign place to you? Hopefully not. Hopefully church should have some semblance of that. And if not, that's what we want to work toward. That's what Paul is saying. Hey, this is where you want to go. This is where you want to be. This is the center of the lane. This is how God designed it. We are going to overreact this way and overreact this way. And we need scripture to kind of pull us back in center and say, this is what's right. This is what God's intend doesn't matter how long I've been knocking back and forth between the gutters. I need to, this is where I start now. It doesn't matter how long you are in the left gutter, you can still come out of it into center now. You don't have to, I've been living in the right lane gutter for 40 years and I'm not going to change. No, this is still what's right. This is still what's orderly. This is still what God commands. This is still what's the best thing for you. And it's no... It's never too late to start down the right path. So God always brings a way back. He always brings a way of escape. He always tells you what's right. And when we put our own flesh into it, we're going to misinterpret. We're going to miscommunicate. We're going to misspeak. We're going to ruffle people the wrong way. We're going to offend people at times. 
our, our hope is that that's not our intention to do that. And on the other side, we say, I'm not going to let that bother me. I'm not going to get offended by that. I'm not going to cut off ties with this person. I'm not going to cut relationship with this person. I'm called to build them up. I'm called to use the gifts of the Spirit to help that person, to help the people I'm around, to help the other people in my church, because we all need help from other people. We're all imperfect. And that's why Paul uses this picture of the human body because we all understand how we love our own body and how our left hand washes our right hand and we work together in unison and that's how the picture of the church should be. We all have our different functions, we all have our different strengths, but we work together to mutually benefit each other. And we don't just do that so we all just get happier and do better, but we do that so we can accomplish the purposes of of God. And if we're sitting there in strife and arguing and caught up on all our own little fleshly hang-ups and insecurities and difficulties and fears and phobias, then we are not very productive for God's kingdom. We're just busy offending this person and starting over with a new person. You know, every person I talk to, they're just all angry people. They just go, you know, it's like, well, well, maybe. But sometimes we got to look at ourselves and take our flesh out of it and see other people the way God sees them. Amen. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do invite your presence of peace here in and among us, Lord God. We seek your order. We seek to do things decently and in order as your scripture commands, Lord God. Give us a discerning heart, Lord God. Give us the gifts that we desire. Help us to prophesy and speak and build up and cheer up and stir up one another, Lord God. Help us to be quick to forgive and easy and quick to repent, Lord God, and come back quickly to the order and the center of your will, where you want us. Help us to be sensitive to your spirit. Help us to be sensitive and understanding to the mind and counsel of God. Help us to do only what you would do in a situation. Help us to lead this church in the way that you would have it be led, Lord God. Help us to always keep you as the head and center of this church and work together in unity to get this church where you are calling it to be. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.